Space for Kentucky Roundtable brings together space-focused businesses and enthusiasts to learn, discuss, and share insights about the space industry. It provides an opportunity for companies and individuals to come together to grow our space economy in Kentucky. Enjoy chatting with like-minded people, networking and learning about the industry. The space industry itself is exploding at an unprecedented rate. It is estimated to be close to a trillion dollars industry by 2040. As cost for entry continues to decline, more opportunities are open for companies to venture beyond the atmosphere. So let's bring some of this opportunity to Kentucky. And that's what Space for Kentucky Roundtable is for. Tonight, we had some amazing guests. We had Janet Ivey, which is CEO and creator of Janet's Planet and president of Explore Mars. We had Chris Carberry, author of Alcohol in Space, Past and Present and Future. He is the CEO of Explore Mars. And we had John Spencer, which is co-founder and chairman of the Space Tourism Conference, as well as founder of the Space Tourism Society. And a surprise guest. We had Beth Pope from Zero G Flights. And here we go with the second Space for Kentucky Roundtable. Not sure we've ever met, but I know a lot about you. I, you know what? I was trying to think, John. I'm going, have we been? And I, I don't know. It's so very nice to meet you. And I can't you wait do. to hear. It's like a big I've fan. been inviting I, John I, to the I, Humans of Mars Summit for 10 years. <laughs> well, John, it's time you come. Yep, it's really yep. good. Uh, it's okay. Really my sweet. wife's going to let me go now. Okay. All right. That's what it took. All right. <laughs> right, right. We're going to go to plan B because the the hookup is not working so we're going to go to plan b and just kind of huddle up we can we can see you good now ivy so you want to come on closer is chris told you all about his stories when he comes to la and all the weird things that happen to him <laughs> oh john speak to oh. me no 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 He's like, keeps it very close to the vest, all buttoned up. Like, oh, I'm just, you know, just working away. So yeah, oh. I have. Uh, the Queen Mary, six, it, the, the Queen Mary incident's East quite Coast. famous, actually. You know, uh, I think they're on be. the East Coast, so we can tell stories now. Okay. <laughs> so are we ready to, to get? Never mind. Oh, sorry. Are we ready to get started? So I absolutely. First of all. Thank you all of you for being here. That is amazing that you're here. This is Dr. Jensen and this is Kay and they're here in the room as well. Dr. Jensen does things with, um, he, does, he works with Moorhead University with satellites and uh, he's in charge of some programs. Yes. And then Kay, she does the, tell, tell them well, what I'm, you do. I'm an R&D consultant. I do conceptual design. I'm a former Disney Imagineer, so I sort of do Imagineering work for uh, other people. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, every now and then, but it's, but uh, a few years ago, I got my, um, my air, airport certification, design certification from every riddle, so I could include that on some of the resort design, because they're getting the vertical lift, and, um, you know, so I needed that. Yeah, that, that must really be a blast. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, you what you did there? Of it. It's really so much. I wasn't going to lose that one. I haven't, I haven't even <laughs> developed, uh, you know, the, for the projects yet. You know, the tech, the the equipment's so early. You know, still in development. So airports can't be designed until the equipment's done. Well, these three guests here, when the news actually wants information on any of on STEM, education, alcohol in space, or uh, space tourism, these are who they call. So they've all been featured. Definitely, on... Yeah, definitely introduced, interested in the alcohol in space, I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Janet Ivy is going to be our first one. She is, her programs have won Emmys. She works with kids and does a program called Janet's Planet. She's been on over 140 stations is where her program is, is listed. And she's won some Emmys and she's done some TED Talks as well. And then we have Chris Carberry, which is an author for Alcohol in Space. And he, both Janet and Chris are both with Explore Mars. She's the president of the board and he is CEO. And they did not know or coordinate that they were both going to be on here tonight. So this is very, very opportunistic. And then John Stenford is with Space Tourism. And he has also written some books. And he is in charge of the conference and the Space Tourism Society. So we're going to have Janet go first. And I'm going to share my screen and then flip. To, and you, do you have a, a PowerPoint tonight? or I, I, I've got some just points to make. But it's like I'm happy to, to just make this a conversation. Um, not, I'm not normal. I normally am at my house and this, uh, tonight I find myself in Rochester, New York in an Airbnb and, uh, we've got an American Astronomical Society eclipse meeting tomorrow as the 2024 eclipse approaches. So if you'll make me co-host, I may go ahead and show some slides, but first of all, uh, to Dr. Jensen there, I don't know if you know about endurance in dot space and it's open source uh, our board of advisor uh, Naeem Altaf who is the chief technical officer um, for IBM uh, and pay a lot of their space tech stuff I'd love to connect you Naeem is all about um, kind of education satellites but he launched this CubeSat and it's like it is open source. Anybody can take the data and extrapolate it. That's what IBM wants them to do and then report back, but it's called endurance in dot space. But if you want to, my email is very simple. It's just Janet at janetsplanet.com. Happy to make that introduction only because when Naeem and I met, Chris and I were having a conversation with him back in the summer of 2019, basically trying to get some good funds from IBM. And actually what sort of bubbled out of it was an educational endeavor. And uh, so, but it's really fascinating and any, any students can do it. You can track that. They, it, it's really fantastic. So, and our hope too is eventually for Explore Mars, we have some opportunities coming up. So if Moorhead ever wanted to uh, partner with Explore Mars, we have, we have some capabilities of potentially sending something up the next time uh, Jared Isaacman goes up. It's not for sure, but if we if you got a good idea, we could partner with that. So, hey, Chris is over there scratching his head going, oh, Janet's committing us to something again. I'm all about community and always like better together. Let me just quickly go through a few slides here. And I, I promise uh, brevity will be the soul of wit tonight. Here's what I learned in 2020. And I'm sure it'd be interesting for us to all have kind of a roundtable discussion about this. I, uh, Chris has me writing a chapter for kind of like in his trilogy of books, Alcohol and Space being one of them. And then the music of space being the second one. And then there will be a series of essays. And one thing I'm working on is what would education on Mars look like? And during the pandemic, it prior to the pandemic, I should probably say if somebody had said, hey, Janet, why don't you teach online? I think I would have probably gone, no, thanks. Who wants to do that? Nobody ever. And then 2020 uh, happened. And so here's what we found out. And it was really disruptive. It was a way to give students a universe of time and attention. And what was really lovely is I had folks all over the country saying, hey, I'll come talk to students. We began March 17th, 2020. We didn't charge anything for it. I thought, hey, if I've just lost everything that's on my calendar, I'm assuming everybody else has. We had 26 kids the first day. I was dumb enough to put my Zoom info like public. Who knew that there could be Zoom bombs and stuff? Not me at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, 26 kids the first day, 76 kids the next day, and 
naively, I thought I'll do it for a couple of weeks. And then nine weeks later, we'd serve 1,200 kids from around the globe. Uh, out of that experience, I was able to garner a NASA grant that carried me through September of 2020 through June of 2021. And we Zoomed with over 10,000 kids from around the country. So it was, it was a it was a leap into the unknown and a way to give them this, but we offered everything. Sometimes it was science and wonder and we would give it to them and like, hey, teach me something. And the kids would come and do science experiments and uh, I would let them be the experts. Um, and then it was interesting. We did some demographics and polling and 65% of the kids uh, who participated, which seems a really an enormous majority were somewhere on the spectrum with ADHD, ADD, or anxiety disorder. And so we have found, I believe, that it's like online learning tends to work for kids who don't always feel completely a part of things in a normal classroom. And so, you know, everybody's kind of like zoomed out, but it's like once we made it we learn lessons. You got to make it fun. You got to make it interactive. This is true whether I'm Zooming or I'm in person, right? Energy is never destroyed. It's only transferred. That's a good physics concept, right? And you got to make it meaningful. You've got to make it personal. And maybe the largest thing is like, even though 10,000 was great, I have about 200 that still connect with me on a fairly regular basis. But the real the real meaning I think happens in the micro and I always hate to say that I, I want it to be the macro right, but the stuff that you really get happens in the micro at this previous uh, human to Mars summit back in uh, May, we had seven kids that attended online classes one. Uh, a selective mute, but she had just like so I met Lucia when she would have been. Uh, seven in 2019 at a live camp in Tom's River, New Jersey. She never really spoke to me. She would tug on me and write me a note and things like that, but selective mute. She attends. So she wins the NASA Junior Lunabotics competition this year um, at age 10. And uh, at the Human to Mars Summit, Chris, again, I've been president now of Explore Mars for about uh, since 2019. And I he tends to let me do things and go, hey, but it's about the kids, right? It's about the next generation. It's about that pipeline of talent. And so at the end of our summit, we were asking the question, how can going to Mars maybe change the um, change humanity? And seven of these kids got up and spoke. And my little selective mute paper in hand and shaking actually read her paragraph. So it was, it was, it was, uh, completely humbling to watch and experience that and to know that everything takes time but space education again this is one of my kiddos who decide who would always wear his astronaut helmet to class and a lot of times it, underneath the grant and doing some online virtual camps I would send them like I'm sure the parents thought why did this lady just send us paper plates and straws in Nashville during the pandemic, uh, myself and an intern were going around because it's like even the post office was fairly inconsistent, dropping off things, uh, you know, at a kind of like safely distanced way so that uh, everybody had the supplies. We're building lunar landers here. And, you know, for me, space education is that gateway into STEM. And it's kind of like, let them be creative. It's like, uh, she this, she's calling this she made this out of like some little uh, cardboard and these little bricks that uh, attach everything together but she thought there should be a zoo on the moon so she called it zoo Palo. but again I'm not going to tell them that there's never going to happen because maybe you know John can speak to this as far as space tourism I'm going to want to take my pet John so you got to figure out a way I can get that up there right so whether we were learning to crochet because hey it might be cold in space that might be it that might be something good that we could spend our time on if there's a a long like uh, dust storm on mars but it was basically to create con context and content and to get them interested space was kind of like that doorway and then we would let their curiosity kind of spiral 
And so it's like, that's what I'm all about with Janet's Planet, with Explore Mars. It's like, how do we create that next pipeline of talent? Kentucky is burgeoning and kind of like, as you think about all the, all that the space is going to uh, be. And as Izzy was probably, I think in her post today on LinkedIn, it's projected in the next 20 or 30 years, it's gonna be a trillion dollar business. But as you're working with kids, and especially uh, to you who is an imagineer and a creative and a scientist, I love making sure kids know that you can let your art inform your science, your science inform your art. It worked for Da Vinci. It should work for all of us. And uh, Tony Wagner of Harvard says that we must let our children play. And in the midst of their play, they may find their passion. And in the midst of their passion, they may very well find their purpose. And uh, that's all in a book about creating innovators, the making of young people who will change the world. And I so believe in that, um, in that particular phrase. But it's if you ever need, um, you know, access to educational uh, curriculum or anything like that, happy to share. But just as you guys, you know, move about or have kids or grandkids or whomever that are interested, know that from plumbers to welders, they're making a lot of money. And because the toilet didn't work so well on Inspiration4, boy, would, oh boy, would they have loved to have had a plumber, right? So making sure that kids understand that it isn't just the astronauts and it isn't just, you know, the elite, that it takes everybody from chefs to, you know, so those are other fun conversations to have as far as education goes, but super hoping that somewhere in the very near future, it's like, I'll be sitting watching the news and like, <laughs> so that's the hope. Thank you, Jen. I always say I'm going to be brief, but I get excited and I talk too long. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so next we have Chris Carberry, and he has the Alcohol in Space book, and uh, he is also part of the Explore Mars. So you want to tell us about Alcohol in Space? <laughs> All right, and can I share my screen? Let's see. I, I made you a coho, yes. Great. Oops. he's setting up i haven't stopped at roots all right can you see that <laughs> she <laughs> turned it around and she got me all right well thank you very much as mentioned before i'm ceo of explore mars but also author of alcohol in space and as janet mentioned this is part of a trilogy of books the next one's music in space and there'll be a third one which will be a compilation book with a bunch of off different authors looking at the future, uh, basically, it's called the future spacefaring civilization, how we're going to get where we are now to a point where we can say that we truly have a spacefaring civilization. But since this is a Kentucky uh, audience, and although Jen mentioned maybe zoos on the Mars, I, maybe we should send thoroughbred racehorses up there at some point. But being that that's probably unlikely, alcohol is probably a better choice right now. And when I started looking, I start, I've been thinking about this idea for over 10 years, mostly out of a joke after conferences would go to bars and then start hypothesizing about wonder what wine would taste like if you made it on, on Mars. Could you do beer? Could you do whiskey in space? And originally started off as a joke, but then I realized the more I looked, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of companies and organizations that were actually looking at this, trying to figure out, could you manufacture alcohol in space? Can you consume alcohol in space? And I don't have time now to go through the whole history of consumption of alcohol in space. Sorry, I'm just going to talk about current companies looking at it. But yeah, I realized there was more than enough for a book, so I might as well be the first one. So something of interest in Kentucky, but Kentucky has not doesn't have a piece of it yet, is whiskey in space. So far, there have been two companies that have sent up whiskey experiments, the Scottish whiskey company Ardbeg and Suntory, the Japanese whiskey company. Both did aging experiments. Uh, with, uh, the Ardbeg experiment was very well publicized and the results were very interesting. It, it got sent up and spent two more years than it was supposed to come back. You know, they had a ground sample, you know, a test sample, and then the space flown sample. 
Apparently the space float and sample was much different and not for the better. Apparently it had overtones, it had its rubbery and fishy taste, which is not typically the taste you want in your whiskey. <laughs> so, you know, but they're not sure if this was a result of the actual packaging and the extremes of space, because they literally had two weeks to put this experiment together when um, Nanorax approached them saying, would you like to send up an art bag experiment into space? And they said, sure, you have two weeks. So it wasn't exactly thought through as well as it probably could have been. So they're now thinking of different experiments that will take into account the extreme rigors of space and you know, if they could do it more authentically. What they did was they had these mixed sticks, whereas they put the sample, the, bur the not the bourbon, sorry, that's in the United States, <laughs> the scotch sample in with uh, little chips of, 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 of basically the barrel of oak. And so that was the result, but it got a lot of PR and it's, it happened to be one of my favorite brands as well, even before I knew it had a space connotation. Suntory was the other one. They sent up two experiments, one still up there, but they've been very closed lipped about the results. They've been wanting to see how the space environment uh, basically mellows their product. And frankly, I have not heard anything back on how it mellows their product. But I, I don't know why they haven't given more publicity on this. But there are more there are more companies than just whiskey companies looking at this as well. The beer industry has been very interested in it. Um, actually, going back to Japan, the first, well, not the first, but <laughs> the most publicized first company, beer company, to send up an experiment with Sapporo. They sent out a barley experiment. They brought down the barley and created a limited edition beer, which they sold uh, for a reasonably high price around Japan. Um, Budweiser has actually sent up four barley experiments. And one of the things I think is wonderful about this, I'm not a great Budweiser fan, but the fact that they are investing in barley experiments in space, doesn't matter if you like beer or if you like whiskey, because of course you can use barley for whiskey as well. It's this is a direct investment in space agriculture. So this is a wonderful thing when non-traditional companies are investing in technologies, capabilities that are required for sustain sustainability and space. So I think it's wonderful when these companies uh, do this. I can't actually see my the slide over here, but I think that must be Ninkasi on the other side. And they sent up a yeast experiment in suborbit and started selling ground control beer, you know, based, based on the yeast that had been up in suborbit. So they got a lot of PR on it. And mostly it's been PR, but there's been some interesting experiments as well. Bostock Beer, which is an Australian beer company, which is actually a collaboration between a beer company, um, Four Pines Breweries and Sabre Astronautics, created this trying to overcome the problem of beer in space. My now, plane. Many of they know That's my plane right there, Chris. What? That's my plane right there. Is that very good? <laughs> I was Were you actually, on that flight. <laughs> I was actually on that flight. Very good. Yeah. I, I well, how did it go? Another, I, I, you know, I know there are multiple were. flights, but was this the flight you were on here? Because I think they've gone up three times with the Boss Dog beer. Okay. Well, I was on one where they were on it because I remember making fun of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we. Thing we were right. doing an experiment and and we had we had an entire 10 by 10 section of it for our for our experiment that was going to be going on the ISS we had to test out and they were they were back there drinking beer and I'm like you guys just came here to have fun although i don't know how much fun yeah. zero, zero g really well and, and that that's actually true because beer may not be fun in space biggest problem well two big problems the biggest is carbonation carbonation does not do well or at least for people in space. On, on the ground in 1G, as you all know, the, the, the carbonation, the CO2 rises to the surface, disperses to the atmosphere in their glass, but it does not do that in microgravity. It goes to the center in a ball and starts expanding and does that in your stomach. So astronauts, when they've had carbonation of experience, stomach cramps and wet burps. Once again, not the result you want from your beverage in space. The other issue is of course, taste. And many of you, I'm sure, also know this, that most astronauts experience a diminishment, diminishment, <laughs> diminished taste, you know, because of fluid shift. And so they feel like they have a head cold. So you also need to try something that's going to overcome that. So Vostok created 
basically, you know, named after your Garin's light, Vostok created, you know, decided to use a stout with a lower level of carbonation. And when I speak to British audiences, they sound say, oh, it sounds like a British beer. So essentially British beer, we think might be what you want to bring into space, but we haven't done it yet. So these little 45 second microgravity stints really aren't enough to see if you're really going to have this problem. But they also developed a dispenser and a glass as well. You know, wine's gone into space. This the I'm going to speed up now because I'm probably going to run long here. You know, back in the 90s, that bottle of Bordeaux on the, my left, at least, you know, went up. You know, from the French, yeah, and this actually goes back to the carbonation because um, the French heard that Coke and Pepsi were sending up experiments, and they did not want <laughs> Coke and Pepsi to be in space before French wine. So they made sure to get a bottle of French wine into space to make sure it beat out Coke and Pepsi. There was absolutely no scientific value to this. It was just, you know, to get a bottle of, of, of wine up there. The one on the other side uh, was that was sent up by NanoRacks uh, was back in 2019. They sent up 12 bottles of Bordeaux to test out aging of uh, aging wine in space. And I know the gentleman who did this, very excited. And you know, we were sold, sold off these bottles for a huge amount. They're, explan they're planning a huge number of other projects, as well as this wonderful big training center for commercial astronauts, luxury facility for uh, commercial astronauts. John, if you haven't met uh, Nicholas Gom, I'll introduce you to him. <laughs> The French are also interested in champagne, once again, having that carbonation issue, but Maison Moum is really excited. And in fact, I was, at, I was um, in Paris just a few weeks ago at IAC as a guest of Maison Moum because they were actually announcing their collaboration between them and Axiom. And they're gonna send up their special uh, champagne bottle, space champagne bottle next year to test it out. And they developed a special bottle, as well as a glass so you can drink it authentically because they want to enhance the conviviality of drinking their product in space because they want to get that market on private space stations. And so they made this wonderful announcement. And of course, they did test on the European version of the zero G flight. And you may notice the gentleman on the left, you know, uh, uh, on the top, Usain Bolt, the famous sprinter, they had him come on the flight for PR and he did a microgravity sprint on the flight. <laughs> Yeah, other companies are looking things at other products like glassware. You know, there's a company called, um, you know, you know, looking at um, zero gravity cocktail glasses. And of course, John knows this project very well, um, <clears throat> you know, by Cosmic Lifestyle. And I, ha I should have, I have a copy. I have a pr 3D printed copy of one of those here somewhere. I should have brought that over. But also another company was looking at whiskey glasses you know as you've seen with astronauts usually they spray liquid into the air and you sip it out or you have a spray bottle but a lot of companies want you to be able to have that that ambiance and be able to sip like you normally would on the surface of the earth and so these glasses generally will fill from the bottom and go up through these grooves or these tubes on the side using fluid dynamics to create you know so you can actually experience drinking your favorite beverage in space authentically so you don't have to spray it into the air so um so regardless there are a whole bunch of companies there are many more i've been you know shockingly not a lot of companies have come up to me since i wrote this book and so but one of the things i thought was most fascinating is everything you need to manufacture and consume alcohol in space mirrors what you need for humans in space. And it's interesting how many speakers that I met or individuals I met while writing the book ended up coming, uh, participating in the Humans to Mars Summit. And next year, is, we're gonna have our biggest one yet in Washington, DC at the National Academy of Sciences. It's already, it's coming together really well. I mean, I'm, I'm usually doesn't come together this fast and um, so many people committing. So if you're going to come to a Humans to Mars Summit, come to this one next year, which is May 16th through 18th in Washington, D.C. at the National Academy of Sciences building. Beautiful building. We have a whole bunch of other side events being planned. I also want to mention we're going to be announcing soon publicly a new organization, the Space Drinks Association, <laughs> which will bring all these players together from the alcohol industry, the agriculture industry, space players, science fiction, etc. 
you know, to bring them together in a trade organization. And I have a quick question. Do I have time to show a quick video? Because Alcohol in Space, as well as the three two other books, are going to be turned, are being turned into documentaries. And I have a trailer for the um, Alcohol in Space. Let's That's give her a whirl. Start. Yeah. I'm not getting any sound. Sound, Chris. Need sound. Uh, uh, how do I win it? If if we're on Zoom, you should be able to go up and just share your sound with your video. Let's see. Um, you know where that is? Because I rarely do this on with the sound. Um, I have never done that, so you can do it. All you do is go like in your top bar. There should be like three dots, and you should. You should be able to say play sound with video. Okay. Um, and it'll share the sound. Okay, let's see if that works. In here, he brings the humanity into this human story. Alcohol has been a part of human culture from the very beginning. Culture is what makes a society. We have the solution. We made only two prototypes, very much alike, you know, and the two prototypes failed it completely. Let's send yeast to space and brew with it. It worked, but what didn't work is us not finding the rocket for 28 days. So that's how it all came about, Sam. It was bonkers mad. It was such a short period of time I had to work with. I kind of love Elon Musk. Musk is a nice example of a culture that wants a hero or a villain more than they want an ordinary human being doing good work. This is actually getting serious. A bottle that gives you the ability to share the champagne, to serve it in a very playful way. On a une expérience qui est fabuleuse, qui n'est absolument pas reproductible sur Terre. Mais le plus incroyable pour moi, c'était de déguster. C'est la gravité zéro. Vous savez, vous n'avez plus, vous avez plus la pesanteur. Donc, vous avez le, le, le vin tapisse tout, tout votre palais. Euh, et en plus, on a une sensation que je n'avais jamais connue. C'est le croquant de bulles. Parce qu'il a fallu percer les bulles, claquer les bulles. Puisque physiquement, il a fallu les, euh, bah, exploser les bulles pour avoir le liquide. Et c'était une expérience vraiment unique. Jules Verne a actually hypothesized bringing grape vines with them and growing vines on the moon thinking that the art and sunshine on the moon would create really wonderful wine vintages. This was the first time they were contemplating agriculture on another planet. This dream of Jules Verne would come true, at least having wine on the moon 104 years later, in 1969, when Apollo 11 landed and Buzz Aldrin actually consumed wine on the surface of the moon. This isn't a bonus, this isn't a nice to have. This is what it means to be human. If we can allow astronauts to be not only machines, but to be people, not only surviving entities, but people, to create, even for, for a few minutes, a society of humans outside of Earth, then this is precious. And granted, that, that, version, that, was that awesome. version was a little heavy on Maison Mom. <laughs> a new version of the trailer will be out soon with a lot more variation. That's one we showed in Paris for Maison Mom. So. Bravo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So next week... Sorry, we ran a little long. <laughs> it's, it's all right. We're you know, you're, you're good. So... Next, we have John Spencer, and he is with Space Tourism Society, and he is also the co-founder of Space Tourism Conference, which is coming in April. So take it away, John. Sure. Uh, let me add a little more to the backstory there. I'm also an outer space architect, and in the last 30 years, I've been using my architectural background for designing real space vehicle interiors and moon bases and Mars mission planning and habitats and all that. And using that background for consulting on movies and TV shows, I'm based in LA, do a lot of entertainment stuff. 
And uh, we're developing a proposed, not yet funded, $2 billion Mars World project to be built in the city of Orlando. And one of my favorite things is master planning for spaceports. So I've done a lot of work in those areas. And as Izzy and I have talked, spaceports are unique because they are that middle ground, that connection to space. And besides vehicle access to and from space, they really have to create a whole community, a whole space city, you might say, with all the elements of mixed use that bring a whole diversity of people together with one big picture of we're moving outward in the solar system, which is really inspiring. But that gets into a million issue, issues of financing and sustainability and cool design and media attention and the training and all of those elements and academies that you can bring together and make sense to mix them and to integrate them on emerging spaceports. Right now, there's about 25 spaceports around the world, 22 of them in operation. There's several people are planning. So I think with Kentucky, you got an opportunity, particularly with horizontal takeoff landing type vehicles to create a whole ecosystem using the spaceport as the hub, the nucleus for that and grow it over time. So I'm very interested in helping out any way we can. Awesome. You want to tell us about the conference and space tourism? Uh, balloons are also a thing that can go into a lot of the, the facilities. Sure. So uh, 26 years ago, believe it or not, I founded the Space Tourism Society. In that era, people were very hostile to the idea of space tourism and, you know, the whole bit. But not so much these days. In fact, they want to get involved and make a lot of money on it. So one of our projects with Space Tourism Society is the annual Space Tourism Conference. And it's here in LA, which is the best city in the world to host these things because we've got all the different elements mixed together. Uh, next uh, April will be our third Space Tourism Conference. We always do it on April 28th as a core date and a day before, a day afterwards we add to it because that's the day in 2001 our friend Dennis Tito became the first private citizen to pay for his trip to space. Mm -hmm. So, and Dennis is pretty interesting, pretty cool. And just announced that he and his wife and some friends are have just booked, this is amazing when you think about it, the third uh, Starship lunar flyby mission. So we've got the first one with Dear Moon. <laughs> then Jared has basically booked the second one and then Tito with the third one. So. What's happening is in the space tourism realm, the next big thing, uh, which will capture a lot of worldwide media, is a flyby of the moon, where you experience Earth distance, you know, see the Earth from moon lunar distance, and we have a live Earth rise, which is a big deal. So our industry, space tourism, space experience is thriving and growing, and the conference brings multiple different segments together, mixes them up, makes a lot of noise, and uh, has a lot of fun and a lot of alcohol too. <laughs> a whole lot of alcohol. And what Chris wrote was brilliant. And he also didn't talk about it, but in science fiction, when you look at Star Wars with the cantina scene and Deep Space Nine with 10 4, or uh, actually uh, Next Generation Star Trek, 10 Forward, which we had several parties on because we work with Paramount, uh, and a whole bunch of other space movies. Humans are always bringing the booze with them. They really are. Uh, so that's a really important part of the whole thing. So uh, yeah, that's usually part of the normal talk, but this was a condensed version. <laughs> that's right. Well, anyway, I helped you out on that. So anyway, with um, what you're doing with Kentucky, which I am now learning about, I I did not know uh, Kentucky has a huge aerospace and high tech mm -hmm. uh, arena and industry and so forth. That's great. Uh, that you want to use space as a motivational tool because as space industry grows, there will be more need for people working on Earth. But, and I get this all the time, you know, I want to go to space. I'm not rich. I'm not going to win a contest. What can I do? Ah! And I always say, work in space. And that means there's going to be more and more people of greater diversity going to space and servicing what I'm designing right now Orbital super yachts, orbital super yacht clubs modeled on ocean super yachts. This is the mega rich. It's really fun to play with these guys. They're really different. <laughs> uh, but there'll be many, many more jobs and diversity of jobs going off world 
as well as preparing people and equipment and services to go off world. So it's a real renaissance of time. So it's great timing for Kentucky to start your uh, real work on your spaceport. Awesome, thank you. And you, John, uh, Chris, you said something about Bev. Are, are you with Zero G? I am with Zero G and the relationship is with, with John, who um, I've been with while I was making my way into the space industry. So I am with Zero G. Would love to talk to you, Janet, because we do a lot of research and education. So I don't know if you've done anything with us, but we would really love to do something with you guys. And Chris, I'm a connoisseur. So <laughs> Absolutely. That's definitely a talk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that we've done, we, you know, we've done some amazing marketing with um, Stoli and um, I've got a great friend in Europe about the name of Charles Palmer, who does an amazing um, array of champagnes and um, beautiful vintages of wine. Definitely we should talk about that. But with Zero G, we're kind of like that first little step, aren't we? We're like that first little step into people starting to understand, especially for young people and, 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 and people my age as well that are starting to think about like, what's it like when you get into space? What's that like? And from the weightlessness point of view, that's what we give them is we actually give them that opportunity for like for seconds at a time, 15 times on a parabola, we give them that opportunity. So John invited me to this and I was so excited to kind of join with you guys and, and hear your perspectives and how we're joining in that and, and actually introducing these people into this idea of what's going to be next and, and what to expect. So I'm just excited to be here and join you guys. Well, yeah, tell us Beth, a little bit Beth about also has a, a background in super yachts and that whole culture, which is very good. And um, we're very delighted that she's gotten into that. And what she said about steps, you have, of course, going to a space museum and then a zero gravity flight. Our friends at Space Perspective developing is the balloons that's go to the stratosphere, suborbital flight, orbital flight, flight unif uh, uh, lunar flight. So there's whole echelon of steps by steps. So we can have customers for life. If you're into space, as you become more affluent, you can do more and more real space experiences. So that, that works out great. But Zero Gravity has given, I think, the inspiration, the company, to thousands of people that they want to go the next step, the next level. And just and I can tell you that. I'm so give, sorry, Izzy. Yeah. Go right ahead. Give a little. Well, uh, I got two. Oh, sorry. Uh, give, a, give a little description of what Zero G is first for the people that don't know. And I will keep it really short, but listen, we've got this amazing 727, Boeing 727, and we take it up and we get to about 20,000 feet and we take a 50 degree angle, okay? And off we go straight up as far as that plane will let us go until we start to curve back around. So at this time where you're going up at this 50 degrees, you're feeling about two Gs of force on your body. So in all honesty, when you're doing C, uh, zero G, you're actually getting both aspects. You're getting a really nice pull on your body. You know this. I see you nodding your head because you've experienced it. You've, you've got this zero G and you can hear the engines as we get over the top and you've got about 30 seconds of complete weightlessness. You're floating around. The first time you do it, right, you have no no idea what to do with your body they used they called me the runner like no no yeah, yeah he's laughing I, I, I was this person i was like yeah i i i almost kicked somebody in the face it, i did as well they were yeah, like you feet. start to try to swim <laughs> I, I didn't do the swimming because they caught me at the running so they caught me yeah yeah exactly moved into the swimming point of of the experience but what I thought was so amazing is that this is the opportunity for people to start to really grasp onto the idea of going to space. Right now, Zero G is doing all the training for SpaceX, for NASA, for um, Virgin Galactic, for Axiom, 
for um, Blue Origin. So we're literally letting these pilots and letting these astronauts start to get a taste of this before they're getting up to ISS for the first time and experiencing weightlessness to actually go, okay, I got it. You know, let me process what this feels like. Um, my first time up was Saturday, last Saturday. I was oh, wow. How, yep. so, how, so how long and have you been with them? Uh, three weeks. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Three whole exciting weeks. I'm a space professional now, though. So clearly. I, so I think yeah. it was three That's years fun. ago that I was on that, the, the zero G flight. And that one was an engineering flight. It was not the 30 yeah. second uh, normal flight. It's the hard yep. one. So they don't, they it don't, is the hard one. they don't put you into Martian gravity first and then lunar yep. gravity and then zero G. They, they just, they just <laughs> slam you right into zero G and then slam you right into zero for G. like an hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you put there for an hour no. and you just got to no. deal with it. But I think what's nice is that right now we're doing three parabolas of lunar mm -hmm. and then we throw in three parab parabolas of Martian. So we're actually giving people an experience of, okay, if you're going to the moon, here's how that feels. And if you're going to Mars, here's how that feels. And if you're going to be an ISS, here's how that feels. Yeah. And it's a, and it, it, they're three very different experiences, aren't they? They're just like, there are, there's a very different reaction in your body on, on what that, what that experience is like. Yeah. And my, you know, I, I, I tip my hat to the pilots too, because uh, I'm a pilot and I've done zero G arcs in uh, small aircraft. And that's why I, it caught me by surprise because I, the thing was, is I, even though I'd felt zero G before I was strapped in, I was the pilot. And so when I was actually free to move, I was like, oh, I'll be fine. But, but it's a little different experience. <laughs> it's different. I would invite all of you, actually. I really would love to have all of you come on. Let's, let's go, get everyone on so that you can actually add this to what you're doing. Add this to, especially Janet and Chris, add this to what you know about space and, and that perspective um, at this stage is, you know, actually experiencing it yourselves. But Janet, specifically, when you're talking about STEM and STEAM students, we have a massive outreach where we're doing things with the teachers and the students that are really going into those areas because we want to be training them up. We want to be letting them get excited about it. And even, so I'll tell you, I just signed this. Actually, my boss doesn't even know this yet. So John, don't tell him. So I know John knows him. John, don't tell him. I'll, I'll surprise him tomorrow. Um, we signed up the Atlanta Falcons, um, the Atlanta Falcons players, right? The Atlanta Falcons players do this mentor. They do this mentor program where each, each player has about four or five mentees and they're going to be taking them up and they're going to be, so we've got five players that are signed up to take four to five of their mentees. And these are students where I would love to get with you, Janet, to talk to them about their science, his, you know, their science future. What can they do with what they're learning about being in zero G? So we just signed them up today, literally about 15 minutes before I got on this call, which is why I was like getting on the call. They, you know, there's amazing ways that we can really start influencing and impacting just normal civilians um, about what's, what's coming with Mars and, 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 you know, with space travel as a whole. So that's me. Awesome. Fantastic. I have two questions. Well, one is, um, you know, also it's like Dr. Shana Giffords is working with Mission Astro Access with Zero G mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and giving people uh, who may be, you know, wheelchair confined or have other kind of, you know, interesting special superpowers and they move about the world differently, but thinking that Zero G is sort of the great equalizer and yes. folks who don't normally get to move in certain ways are capable there. John, are you working with Orbital Assembly or Beth, are you working with Rhonda and Tim at all since they're working with that Pathfinder and Voyager kind of circular orbiting station? Are you working with them at all? Uh, no. I'm not, but I would love to, John. Actually, uh, 
No, not with those guys. I'm working with a few other special groups who are very close to Axiom Space, and we're developing orbital super yachts. And I mean, that's real stuff. But uh, we we actually try to be like Switzerland in our conference. We invite everybody and invite everybody to the event and stuff like that. But uh, I usually I'm do my own, board of my advisors. own space. Yeah, I'm on the board of advisors for Orbital Assembly. You simply sure. must know Rhonda and Tim Alator. Oh, yeah. So I'll yeah. uh, I'll enter, make an introduction. Oh no, I we know those guys. Uh, we oh, you I know think, those guys. Thank you. Yeah, much, much appreciated. Thank you, and um, keep pushing forward. I will tell you that you know I I I started as a really young girl that watched Star Wars and thought it'd be amazing to go to space and knew that I was never going to be smart enough you know, or clever enough to um, be an engineer or, you know, the, the types of people that were going into space. What I found so amazing is that exactly what you said a moment ago, which is there are jobs in space. There are places for everyone. And one of my hashtags is space for more. There is space for all of those people now that want to find this, a place, an opportunity to be involved in this amazing industry, there's a place for them. So I'm absolutely behind any of you guys that are doing things that are promoting that idea, you know, get with John, he knows how to get with me. And I would love to take, to, to be a part of that and to bring zero G into, you know, supporting what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm really impressed. Yeah, this is an area, I'm glad you guys are talking about this. This is an area which we've been pushing with Explore Mars. You know, for so many years, people associated space with the rocket companies. Mm -hmm. Those guys are important. We're not going to space without the rocket companies, but there's so much more. Yeah. You know, if we truly are going to be living and working in space, you need more than the transportation. You need to breathe. You need to eat. You need to yeah. communicate. You need medicine. You need entertainment. You need all aspects of human civilization because... You know, this old model we've been going off for so long, you know, that NASA model of the astronauts who don't, you know, <laughs> have no vices, or at least publicly have no vices. <laughs> um, um, that's not realistic. And, you know, people are not going to be working 24 hours a day are not going to all be responsible for the lives of everybody around them other than common sense stuff. It's not going to be their job, though. And so this is how you actually think about the future of civilization because you have to think about his civilization and not a a mission yeah you know just uh as a, a, a way of thinking about it if you look at the crew members and the diversity of their activities and responsibilities on a large super yacht ocean super yacht those will translate almost perfectly for orbital super yachting from the chef to the stewards to the maids to the cleaning to the engineer, the captain, support people. So that means the diversity of jobs is going to continually grow and diversify. Uh, so that that's the way we talk about it: is the renaissance of more people going with greater diversity, doing more things. Therefore, there's more opportunities to experience uh, space experiences. So you know, I want to loop something back to Kentucky, though. So it's, I didn't really talk about in my talk, it was called Bourbon in Space. I didn't mention Bourbon in Space. This is an area that, you know, a number of people in Kentucky or have interest in Bourbon have reached out. And this is, you know, it's, it's an area where the space community in Kentucky and the Bourbon industry in Kentucky and elsewhere around the country as well. I know you guys think you're the only one to make the only true bourbon, but you know, uh, I, I'm sure uh, Janet has Janet State has other opinions on that. And no, legally, you know what? My dad is from Covington, Tennessee, and Jim Beam all the way. So Kentucky <laughs> bourbon only for my dad. So <laughs> very good. But this is something, as I mentioned, it's been. Whiskey has only been, um, well, the Scottish and the um, Japanese. Why, why, have it, why hasn't bourbon been in space? And so it'd be interesting to start formulating, not just to have fun that too, but figure out what could the bourbon industry do that really highlights the industry, advances the product, and truly just some new aspect of well, alcohol in space, whether it be, you know, whether it be aging, how things per, uh, not, distill, 
in space or, you know, as more and more of these commercial players come online, one of the biggest problems has been since officially this has been prohibited by every space agency, even though, wink, wink, guess what? People have been drinking in space for decades, but because it's not been official, since it's officially prohibited, it doesn't officially happen, so you can't have studies. And so there have been no studies on how humans metabolize alcohol in space. And so we know people don't die, <laughs> you know, from the small amounts. We know they don't get, you know, it doesn't, doesn't impact them dramatically in a different way than here on Earth, but they've only consumed it in small amounts, small shots. And there's been no, no formal studies, just basically anecdotal tales. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to try to get the bourbon industry engaged in some sort of interesting, fun, public, but also useful experiment. It's actually doing something that actually proves out, you know, what happens to the human body because now the commercial sector is going up and with more regularity, people are going to start drinking more openly in space. And it would be good to know scientifically how this interacts with human bodies in microgravity or in one sixth gravity or in one third gravity. We don't know. Well, and I would like to put it out there that maybe the bourbon companies could actually sponsor a test using the twins that are going to be going up on Axiom. So there's a twin yeah. study getting ready to happen. Yeah, I actually yeah. know some people from Brown Foreman. I know the former vice president of Brown Foreman and uh, some of the people in their uh, marketing. So that would be interesting uh, to, to pitch, I think, uh, to mm -hmm. somebody like that. Uh, you know, I was going to say, um, uh, John, you, since you mentioned the super yachts, you might agree with me. I was just having a conversation. I'm part of the Kentucky Aerospace Council, and uh, we were having a conversation about who really should be controlling the laws in space. And uh, my opinion is it should be based, uh, basically based on maritime law. And I like how you keep it, uh, you know, um, sort of saying, well, you know, it's like a super yacht and the people working on it, it's like, the people that are working on ships it just it, it it seems to sync up to me that if you're if you're looking at it from that point of view it's like sort of living on the ocean but with yeah. even more uh even more issues like lack of oxygen <laughs> yeah right. it'll kill you well, a couple of a couple of quick points is you're right uh all of our space treaties are based on maritime law because that was the precedent that's been around literally for hundreds of years and stuff. You know, if, if one of our astronauts lands in your country, please be nice to them and give them back. Thank you very much, you know, type stuff. Uh, but eventually we're gonna have, and we're working on this right now, a Coast Guard for space, which we of course call the Space Guard. That's different from Space Force. I'm an advisor with Space Force. So it's like Blue Water Navy and Coast Guard type stuff. But all of that infrastructure, what Chris was kind of alluding to, we need to think about and need to implement. One of the fastest growing fields right now, believe it or not, is space law and lawyers getting into that and dealing with insurance and all of these treaties and all of these different things. So that's that's fascinating is that what we've been saying more and more lately to help new people and companies get into the space world, you need a frame of reference. Because everybody thinks space is so far away and out there and scary and ah, that stuff. So we talk a lot about the oceans of space. And we say everything we do on our oceans today, except fishing and drilling for oil and gas, we will be doing in space, in orbit, uh, on the moon, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, and that helps people, I found, I've done it hundreds of times now, you kind of sense that they're kind of getting it more because they can relate uh, to the oceans. So the oceans of space is very good. And another quick thing, uh, and again, for spaceports, sustainability. Designing your spaceport, designing real space facilities, real lunar bases have to be as self-sustaining as possible. So you have to create biospheres. So you're refreshing the air and the water and you're growing on food and dealing. A big part of all this is dealing with waste management, human waste management, other waste management. So when you integrate design into sustainability for your spaceport, you're doing a good thing because it's a sustain sustainable spaceport. You're saving operational costs but people are learning how to operate on earth more sustainably and more efficiently. Yeah. So space is a motivator for 
deeply getting into biospheres and sustainability. It's got all the cool stuff. You just have to mix them together. Absolutely. Um, is, do you feel like you've got a fairly strong um, group of people that are interested in space that are um, what in Kentucky? Yeah, we yeah. have just started. Basically, the seeds were planted what a couple of months ago, and uh, so we are we are getting the awareness up. So this is the second oh. meeting of the Space for Kentucky. Now, I, I, will, well, I would uh, like to that, that over the last, uh, I'd say, 25 years. Um, well, so so about over the last 25 to 30 years, Moorhead State University's had a space science program, mm -hmm. and uh, that has attracted a lot of students. Just recently, the University of Kentucky started an aerospace program. Um, aerospace is actually Kentucky's number one export. It's not bourbon. It's 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 not horses or anything. It's it's actually aerospace. It's more on the manufacturing really? side of aerospace. Um, there's only a couple places that do just pure space, right? We have Space yeah. Tango in Lexington. We've got, I used to work for Red Wire. Um, they're not technically in Kentucky. They're across the river. We'll uh, claim, we'll we'll claim. But yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then of course we have, we have Moorhead State. Um, I also have my my own company as as well, and, and we do some things. So it's growing. the 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 space industry in, in Kentucky is growing, um, but it's already the aerospace industry is already very big here. So it's just people are seeing this shift towards. Well, we're building Boeing seven forty sevens. You know, parts for those. Uh, we might as well build parts for SpaceX rockets, uh, which is already happening in Cincinnati. I was immediately, you know, I, I just saw the CEO of that company just a couple hours ago. So it's, it's, it's exciting. Well, and I, I, should have, I, I should have mentioned earlier, it was a Kentucky company that arranged the Budweiser experiment to go into space, Tate Space Tango. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just actually met with Chris Kimmel uh, a few hours ago as well. He was, he used to be the chairman of the board of Space Tango. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, since you guys, oh, I actually am a native of Kentucky. And I went to school at University of Kentucky first, and I went to University of Cincinnati, which um, in Ohio, uh, it's, it's really, this was the foundation of aviation was right in this area. Uh, and we really used to fly as planes right here in Kentucky. And they had their airport uh, over in Cincinnati, which is where he teamed with, um, you know, Embry-Riddle and they had the original school, the aviation school which taught many of the early astronauts and, and in Ohio. So from there, it branched off into Dayton and uh, the other cities. When I was a, a University of Cincinnati student, uh, Neil Armstrong was down the hall. Um, he was teaching engineering and I had Bucky Fuller for my professor. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Ooh wanted to become a theme park designer and I was in okay. arts and theater and, and, and theme park designer. And, uh, but, uh, Bucky Fuller was why I was interested in working with Disney and he was designing the geosphere for the gate of Epcot at the time. So I go <laughs> way back into all of this, you know, with, uh, wow. And, uh, just completing, um, you know, I actually applied to Embry Riddle before I went to the university of Cincinnati and, um, uh, the Air Force didn't accept women uh, when I applied, but I, I was a balloonist and uh, uh, working in, in that area all through my teens and flying in my teens. So I was very interested in aviation. But when I got to Disney, I actually worked on some of their space projects like the moon ride and some of the other things. A good friend of mine, Andy, Andy Probert, had come from um, uh, uh, um, the um, Paramount group of people, and he was doing some design there, and we worked together on doing some things later with Star Trek and designed, you know, their projects for Nevada. So I've sort of seen a lot of these people that were in the original aviation industry. A a Andy was in the Navy, and that's where he brought, you know, uh, but a lot of them brought their, their military uh, influences into it. So, um, but anyway, so for me, it's it's all part, been part of my original education. It's not really something I'm getting into. It's something that's been with me for, you know, my entire life. 
Um, we just had their Bowman Field Airport 100th anniversary. It's the oldest running airport in the United States. And wow. uh, so we have a long tradition, you know, let's where Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart all flew across this yeah. whole area and they taught everybody else, you know, and um, so it's, it's, it's just a quiet little secret. It, it's because it's an agricultural uh, state and everybody flew around and crossed their fields. Almost all the airports are made <laughs> fields here because they were all originally fields. And uh, there's a real resurgence going on in Ohio, just up the road here with all the uh, Amazon hub and the, doing the aerospace things there. So it's, a, it's starting like in the aviation um, side of it. And it's Same with us. into the space side of it, you know, but it's, it's all its roots is really in an aviation area, so. And, and, and what might be interesting is like, could we find, like, could we, could we get the plane, could we get our plane there for, you know, the Kentucky Derby and like bring oh, in, yeah. would that, wouldn't that be amazing and like have us there and in the morning, you know, we take everyone up and we run some parabolas with everyone. And then we do something with the Derby and we bring in these people that are going to help us spread this message um, in Kentucky and on the East Coast, because you, you guys get such an amazing uh, group of people that are coming in. Well, you send that's a, that's a great idea. That's because a really good well, idea. Partner the, works the <laughs> Actually, the, the, okay. the so airport the, that's like tied into the horse racing. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the airport across the street from the racetrack. And that is where. And, and how long is the race? How long is the. Into that yeah. airport. So all the Arab. Because, you know, a thoroughbred can take a thoroughbred. It's half Arab horse. Yeah. And, uh, bred from the Arab Arabian. So uh, they come in to that Keenlands airport. Not, not yeah. so much uh, Louisville's. But uh, what's what's the what's the length of the runway there? Well, they had to enlarge it because they actually had a, a an accident at that runway, and they they lengthened that runway so they could bring in the the larger. Yeah, you it's uh, it's um. It could I want to say it, it can do a seven forty seven. It can yeah, do a seven forty seven. Okay, that's I mean, like as long as it's seven thousand feet, you know, we can yeah. get the plane there. I think it's well, they, twelve. They fly. They fly all the horses in and out of that airport in Cincinnati, yeah. mostly, and the horses are very well traveled. You know, animals. Yeah. Travel the horse. The horses. Yeah, all the horses from the horses. Well, I live close to Ocala, so there's literally a, an airport just for horses in Ocala. So I, I actually <laughs> put a whole paper on the uh, the horses for the Keeneland Airport because you know from my uh, certification with Embry. Uh, for airport design because it is a very big industry of carrying horses all over the world and uh, well, there you go we could get we could get chris to come in with some alcohol people right we get janet to come in we'll, we'll bring in some you know some students and some teachers and let them be a part of it john you're just the brains of the whole organization i mean you're fantastic you just you know everyone so and i'll and 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 someone bring the horses and let's have a race <laughs> <laughs> so what you got to do is you got to get morgan freeman involved because he flies he's a pilot and and he flies in every every derby yeah what okay. is his play he his horses. Yeah. Is he really yeah. Yeah. A, yes he races his horse that's here and he actually won on them trots i think mm -hmm. recently yeah. so Wait. that's what he really be fantastic we'll get morgan up there <laughs> we'll do we'll do a competition with janet get some students and some teachers up there as well I think I I think we might be on to an idea, guys. I love it. Not about budget. So, what else do we need? We need budget. We like need the budget. UPS like World Sports is based in Louisville, and you have the Amazon, uh, and both of them have their R and D centers where they're where they're testing out the new flight vehicles for for you know flying things around, usually medical kinds of, of equipments and things like that. So Amazon's doing all that testing right up. In northern Kentucky to Cincinnati's airport, it's in actually in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and the uh, world port of UPS is based in Louisville. So you've got all the international flights that come into those two airports, and from there they go then they go down 65 or north to Chicago down to the Gulf, and on the uh, the more um, 
eastbound uh, is from 75 Highway, so it goes up and north and south from there. So those two primary airports are the center points of the whole country. And uh, so it, it it's really a, just a quiet little secret. Most people just don't really know about it unless you live here and you, you know what's yeah. sort of going on. But the rest of the country, the reason why aviation is probably pretty, pretty much, I think the reason why it's number one here is has to do with the uh, military bases that we have here, Fort Knox, Fort Campbell, Fort whatever was the other ones. <laughs> so they are the only like ones that are buying all the aircraft for the military use, and this is where they have their training. So that's a big part of the industry right there. Right before COVID, Kentucky was number three in the nation for aerospace manufacturing exports, and it was for worth $14 billion a year. So that, that was the year before COVID. So of course, COVID kind of wiped all the numbers and skewed them all, but so those were those were solid numbers. Well, what do you think, like John? You, do you think we can pull this together? Sure. I think we I can, because look, look here, you got 79 aerospace-related facilities in Kentucky and 62 aerospace-related projects since 2014. And let's go find that guy who, you know, remember the the winner this past Kentucky Derby was like completely like came from behind every time I, I replayed that race so many times watching that darn thing. And how fun would it be bet that it's like we also take, uh, you know, kind of like the whoever wins the roses that yep. you're up for the flight too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea. That would be fun. <laughs> the Japanese uh, company that was involved with your bourbon. Because I yeah. wonder if it was the same as Four Roses. Because the Japanese firm does own Four Roses, which is one of the oldest distilleries here in Lexington. And they have their own brand name for what's sold in Japan, but they make Four Roses bourbon. If you're uh. I did not know that. Yep. I, think, I think Jim Beam so, actually owns Suntory now. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. John, they're it, yeah. it's the international world that of these own the that are involved in the verb, and they they actually bought it from Seagram's, uh, the Japanese. Oh, okay. Here, and they bought it from Seagram's, who of course is Canadian. So there's other international companies um, that own many of the stories here. John, how do we pull this together? Uh, sure. Well, you know, Izzy, Izzy is the chairperson, kind of seeing it all come together. So yeah. we can we can do that. One suggestion to have, since you're in the early stages of developing your space uh, experience community, is space camps, Mars camps. Camps are a really good business. Uh, we know a lot about that. We have a Mars camp program, actually. Uh, and space camps tend to get a lot of support from a diversity of people uh, and winners of prizes. Uh, I don't know what the ages are, although I saw a kid on one of the films from Zero Gravity, a young one. I was like, whoa, that was what we were involved in helping to start Zero Gravity Company. And the big question was, what's the youngest thing you can have? But if kids were doing space camp uh, and they won something, they might be able to fly on Zero Gravity. And, uh, you know. That's just a great thing when you have a STEM space camp stuff. Now, Izzy, you told me you have challenger centers, two of them in your in your state. So I you already have it. Yeah, center. there's one in Hazard and the uh, I went to the one in Louisville. So. I've been to the one in Hazard. I know Tom very well who runs it down there. Uh, That's a great nucleus to build out from. Yeah. I they actually just refurbished their entire place in, in Hazard there working on they're going to have a one-tenth scale model of sls there which is wow. still huge <laughs> i've i've been in the vab because i we designed a satellite and we had to install it and so it's on sls right now and don't get me started on the delays but anyway um so i have been in the vab with the real thing you know the sls and it is massive and then uh tom was showing me the other day when i was down there uh, their one tenth scale model. I'm like, this thing is still huge. <laughs> wow. Uh, Moorhead has Lunar Ice Cube on the payload for Artemis One, which they've been waiting wow. all a year. year. And a half yes. At this point. Yes. Yeah. So, they, what they is have, that? And then uh, it is detecting water. So yeah. So Lunar Ice Cube is a six U CubeSat, 
it was uh, a NASA mission. We were hired by NASA at the University Science Center to uh, design and build it. It's uh, going to detect um, water ice on the moon. It's going to map that water ice. We've already detected it, obviously. We have Luna map. We have Luna, uh, like Luna H map. We have lunar flashlight, et cetera, all these other missions. Uh, so we, we know that water is there, but we don't know how the distribution of water is. And so it's it's it, the the intent of the experiment is to map that water to see where it's coming from, so we can better get an idea of like how much water is there and how we could utilize that with you know in situ resource utilization for a, a moon base or you know you know having a, a real presence there on the moon. Yeah. Hey, and you guys, uh, you guys want to hear my lunar joke? Yes, yeah. I love jokes. <laughs> okay. Well, first off, the moon's not very funny. I only know one lunar joke and I came up with it, all right? So to pick up on what you're saying, we know that there's water ice on the South Pole from comets that deposit it and there are craters, the sunlight never sees it. Da, da, da. So a lot of research was done in that area. But in the last several years, they discovered there's a fair amount on the North Pole as well in forms of ice and craters and all that stuff like that. So today now, the, new, the moon actually is now basically bipolar. <laughs> well, going uh, off of the bipolar. moon segue, <laughs> going off the moon segue, I have a box here that I got from Taiwan yesterday. And what is in this box is really cool. It is um, from Grand Systems. It is moon silicate it's the reconstruction oh, it's a, a synthetic moon dust oh, so that so it can do simulation studies. regular yes simulation regular thank you simulant so wow that, cool? that is so freaking cool yeah so really from grand systems and it is from um kwan hanky so thank you for that and I, I fully awesome. expect they, they are doing quite a bit of stuff with uh, dip, growing food in. in <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to take that. Thanks. <laughs> so, I have some experiments to do. I was so excited to get that yesterday that I could share it today. So I apologize, but I'm going to have to drop off in like I didn't one see minute. You. I'm from, <laughs> gotta go as well. wrap up. They're going to kick us out here in a minute. So. But thank you guys, and I will have this recording posted, and we will make sure that everybody is linked up, and we will get information to everybody that to to make sure everybody is connected. And we yeah, will... yeah this was a lot of fun, lots of great ideas. And, yeah, thank and you, Izzy. Much appreciate it. Yeah, oh, so nice you. to meet everybody. Yeah, everybody. And thank you, John, for inviting me. I really appreciate sure. it. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. You added a lot to the discussion. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Very much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Wow. That was good stuff, wasn't it? That is what this is all about. I hope you can join next time. More guests and more space. The website for this is spaceforkentucky.com. Until next time, reach for those stars. <laughs>